Proverbs, the ninth chapter, verse 10 through 11 says this. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, uh, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. As my son's already said, most of you know, Thursday was my birthday, 3rd June. And I want to say thank you for all the cards, the gift cards, uh, the calls, uh, the cookies, uh, the congratulations on reaching and accumulating so many years. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. It was just wonderful as the different ones began to call in and and uh, even sing happy birthday uh, on the phone. I, some of them, I think I'm going to start listening in the choir. I think sing pretty good. And so uh, it, it was just a great day uh, to celebrate and appreciate it so much. Uh, the wonderful thing about accumulating 79 years uh, is the fact that you learn some stuff. <laughs> the longer you live, it seems like the more experience you get, and uh, you're able to learn some things that uh, uh, over the years that uh, are kind of special. I learned that even the smartest person is not always right. <laughs> Have you ever found that? The smartest person is not always right. I've learned that a happy wife is a happy life, and she's the smartest one. <laughs> Amen. I've learned this morning that uh, life is not always fair, but chocolate is always good. <laughs> I've learned that there's nine fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentle goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Uh, uh, but it's chocolate that smooths the Spirit this morning. Uh, and the reason you need chocolate is that there's some people you're just not going to be able to change no matter what you do. <laughs> so you just get alone, have a little piece of chocolate, and just kind of smooth things over. If you want to know what I have not learned, ask my wife. She can tell you. <laughs> Amen. Now, you know, your view of life changes from your, when you're in your 20s and 30s to in your 60s and 70s. The view of life changes. You, you don't have the same perspective when you're 20 and 30. Uh, when you're 20 and 30, you think, well, I've got plenty of time. I, I, man, I, I'm busy. I'm trying to raise my family. I'm trying to get my career together. I'm trying to do some things. I, I'm trying to get my house taken care of. I, all these kind of things we think about in our 20 and 30s. Uh, and so heaven is not quite as much on our mind as at 20 or 30 something uh, because we think we've got a plenty of time. But when you're getting 60 and 70, <laughs> Not far from home. <laughs> Amen. The trip is not going to be as long as what it was. <laughs> Amen. You just, uh, you, you understand that. Uh, but there, there's some different things uh, about life. Uh, you know, at 25, your muscles are at a peak. It's in your 60s that your vocabulary is the strongest. I, just the little things about your life you don't realize and you don't think about until uh, sometimes you just kind of put it together and you, you got to just keep moving. You say, well, well, Pastor, what is the best age? Uh, out of all the ages you've been so far, what is the best age? What, 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 what would be the best age for me? I'll tell you the best age for you right now is the one you're living. Right. The age you're at right now because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. Take life where it's at right now. Enjoy every day of it. Keep moving. Uh, let it be a, that which just blesses you where you are right now. This morning, uh, now there's a lesson of life that you can't afford not to learn. I believe it's the greatest lesson in life for all ages, all times, uh, uh, all periods uh, for any person. Uh, uh, the greatest lesson that they could ever learn this morning because... Out of this lesson, out of this life lesson flows all of the other uh, things uh, uh, with a level above anything else, at a level above anything else. Uh, our text gives us a little insight uh, to what this lesson is. Uh, if you look at first Mark, uh, the first chapter of Mark, you find Jesus there. Uh, John the Baptist is announcing uh, the coming of, of Jesus, and we find John the Baptist in that 
same chapter, baptizing Jesus at the river of Jordan. And, you know, the voice of the Lord said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I had to be a special day, a special moment. It was right after that. He's, he's in the wilderness for 40 days. The Bible says tempted of the devil. When he come out of that, he's by the shore of Galilee. As he's walking by the shore of Galilee, he begins to call his disciples. Uh, he calls Simon and Andrew, his brother. A little ways down the shore, uh, he calls uh, a couple more of his disciples, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And, and these five, now they, they, he's starting to gather his disciples. And the Bible says on the Sabbath day, they go into the synagogue at Capernaum. As they go in, Jesus is teaching. He begins to teach the people, and the Bible says he teaches them with such authority, with, with such an impact, uh, that uh, unlike the priest uh, uh, that was there, uh, uh, the scribes, uh, but he taught with such a power and authority and wisdom, uh, uh, they were all amazed at, at what uh, his ministry was. But it didn't stop there. After he, he teaches the lesson for that day. He gives the message. Uh, he casts out a demon, uh, an unclean spirit, the Bible says, out of this person. From there he goes to uh, Simon Peter's house and heals his mother-in-law. From that, the Bible says he's from sundown into the late evening. He is healing all various disease and casting out devils. In other words, he's had an exhausting day. Ministry is an exhausting uh, 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 career. I mean, it's an exhausting uh, uh, profession. If you're ministering at a level that uh, uh, you're giving of yourselves constantly over and over, you're giving of it gets kind of exhausting. I can imagine Jesus was exhausted that day uh, when he came in that evening, he was just uh, absolutely wore out. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that the next morning, before the crack of dawn, before anybody else gets up, before they have breakfast or coffee or anything else, the Bible says he goes out to a solitary place. And there he begins to pray. He could have slept in. He could have been, well, you know, yesterday was a powerful day. I, I did a lot of good stuff. I, I had an enormous successful campaign that day in ministry. Uh, and so I, I think I'll just sleep in this morning. But the Bible says he, he got up, he went out, and he began to pray. Jesus knew that the years of quietness and isolation that had been in Nazareth would now be behind him. There'd be no more moments like that uh, because the events of that day uh, of the ministry of healing and delivering people had launched him into a, a public ministry now. So he'd no longer be just one uh, of just uh, coming through the crowds as, just, uh, uh, as he had been. Uh, but now from now on, the days would be filled with people who had needs, all kinds of needs. Uh, and he would touch and he would heal. Uh, he would minister. He would teach. Uh, he would cast out devils. Uh, but he would also face questions, ridicule. He'd face Exact accusations. He would be mocked. He would be misunderstood. Who would he turn to? For rest. For solace. Who would he turn to for relief and rest? Where would he go? Following the demands of the ministry. He went to the Father. He would go to the Father in prayer. Every military man knows what it is to leave home. Uh, go on assignment out of country, thousands of miles away from home, missing all the special occasions, the birthdays, uh, the holidays. Uh, they know what it is to be alone. They know what it is uh, uh, to have the stress of not only being in that assignment for whatever it is, uh, but also the fact that they're away from the loved ones and fellowship uh, where they can enjoy their family. What about Jesus? Think about Jesus. He left heaven. Placed it. You and I don't even begin to have the mind 
to be able to conceive what heaven is like. We, we cannot imagine what that is like. But he left all of that behind. Uh, came to earth that was filled with sin and corruption. Uh, all kinds of problems of mankind. Uh, and it was there that uh, he would come and minister to people. It just it was uh, in these wee hours of the mo- morning uh, that he would get the relief from all of this that leaving home uh, Ministering to people, it would be in these wee hours of the morning that he would find that rest and recovering his strength to his soul. There he would speak the language of heaven, prayers that are far different from your and my prayers. He wouldn't have to ask for forgiveness. He wouldn't have to ask uh, uh, that for help to get out of trouble. He wouldn't have to have help or ask for help to, from a messed up situation of his life. He prayed for Thanksgiving, communion, fellowship with the Father. It was just uh, uh, that time where he received strength. Uh, but I believe most of those prayers uh, would be for those uh, that he would minister to. Uh, those that sometimes would want to see his miracles, uh, but had very little interest in his teachings. Uh, right. You can draw a crowd off of the hype and the excitement of all kinds of things happening. Uh, but very little want real straight teaching anymore i believe he prayed about the next community the town and people which he would preach to that god would help lead him and direct him into just the right place and strengthen him that the doors would be open people would be touched uh, lives would be changed people would be healed Uh, if jesus found it necessary to be alone in prayer to get strength from the Father. How much more do you and I this morning uh, need that same strength? That need that same uh, encouragement? Uh, surely our schedules are no more busier than his was. Uh, no more full than his schedule was. Uh, what Jesus is showing us in the scripture this morning. Uh, that if we want that divine strength for our lives. Uh, that it is uh, something we've got to do this morning. We've got to uh, take time to spend with the Lord. We are far better off to lose a few hours of sleep uh, uh, and have that time of prayer. We often think it's the other way around. Well, I need to sleep. I need I need more rest. I need more sleep. Uh, and yet, uh, why not follow the example of Jesus this morning? Uh, set aside some time. Uh, uh, lose a little sleep. Put a little TV time away, internet time away, sports away, and find that time for prayer. Jesus uh, knew he could not function effectively if he had not had that time in prayer. Now, this is the Son of God. Here's one uh, who uh, knew what it was to minister, and yet he needed prayer. Prayer has to become our daily habit. If you've not developed a daily habit of prayer, of a long time with God. If you've not developed that time where you get along with God, shut everything else out, then you're missing a treat. It's a time where we love on the Lord. It's a time where we adore and appraise Him, unpack the issues of life. It's a time when we are interceding for others that have needs. Uh, you'll be amazed what it means to, to be in His presence and how God responds to your prayers in those moments. We need to really understand that What we need is time alone with him. Time alone with him. You know what it was when you was a boyfriend, girlfriend. You you didn't want to sit in the house with the mom and dad. I mean, you wanted some alone time. (laughs) You know know what I'm talking about. I I, I was struggling so bad. I I, I wanted to be, I I just wanted to be with with my wife. I just wanted to be with her. And uh, I even took typing twice. (laughs) That was an all girls class. I mean, no boys in that time took typing. <laughs> it wasn't because I wanted to type. I just wanted to be with her. That song this morning, I just want to be with you. <laughs> I pick her up for school. We take her, I take her for lunch and take her home. For, and we go out on that. I was with her most of the time. But I just want to be with her so bad I took typing. I mean, I had it bad. It's understanding this morning that in his presence, it's in his presence 
that things change for us. We're strengthened. Uh, we're renewed. Uh, that we understand this morning alone with him. That our wills, our character, our attitude become aligned with him. We become more on the same page with Jesus. Uh, there's no substitute for a good, uh, uh, consistent prayer life. There's no substitute. You cannot, you cannot do anything uh, that would... Profit you more than to have a prayer life uh, alone with God. It's been the prayers that's been prayed over me and for me. It's been the prayers that people have prayed that I didn't even know people were praying. It's been the prayers I prayed for myself that has allowed me to get to this age of 79 right now. I can tell you. If it had not been for prayer, I would not be here today. Many of you, if it had not been for prayer, you wouldn't be here today. Somebody has prayed for you. Uh, you see, in 1944, polio was a death sentence. Uh, I was two years old, got struck with polio, and was at three weeks without a bite of food, uh, little to drink. I was at the point of death. My eyes had already been set. When a man of God came, in fact, he couldn't come. He had to talk because the house was quarantined. Prayed a prayer over that phone with my mom and dad. Within one hour, after not having anything to eat for three weeks, I asked for an egg. It all turned around. God healed my body. Totally restored me. Been through many, many physicals in the military and all that. And not one effect of polio. At six or seven years old, when I was trying to drive a nail, uh, one of these um, shingle nails, uh, big headed galvanized nails into a piece of oak. <laughs> you, you know how hard oak is. I hit that thing with a hammer and it glanced and went straight into my eye. My dad was cutting grass. I ran to him and he pulled that nail out of my eye, took me to the eye doctor. I heard the doctor say, well, your son's destroyed that eye. He said, all I'm going to do today is put stuff on it to keep the infection down. So I want you to bring it back Monday. This was sort of Friday. I want you to bring it back Monday. Let me check and make sure that his eye has not uh, uh, got really infected. Well, I had the patch over my eye when it brought me up to the church on a Sunday morning. Just like we did this morning. We prayed. Brought me up. Laid hands on me. Anointed me with the oil. I didn't feel a thing. But the next morning when I went into that doctor's office, he began to look into my eye. And uh, I remember him now just, just like yesterday. He had this thing and he, he, he covered one eye, began to look into it and, and uh, went back to the record, scratched his head a little bit, come back, looked at it again. Then he pointed to the big old chart with the E going this way up, you know, the big directions. Uh, so can you see that? I said, yeah, I can see that. I said, all the way down to the bottom. Told my dad, I said, I don't understand. He said, Friday, that boy destroyed that eye. I said, but this morning, I don't see so much of the scar. I'm going to tell you, God knows how to heal. He knows how to answer prayer. He knows how to do exceedingly abundant and more than we could ask or think uh, 10, 11 years old, I'd already accepted the Lord as my Savior when I was about six or seven, a little tent meeting, I prayed the sinner's prayer, accepted the Lord. But at about 10, 11 years old, Dad took us all over to Norfolk, Virginia to see a Billy Graham film on missions. My neighbor went, two years older than I was, Neil went with me, and man, is. This film was with the grass huts and all over in Africa as a missions film. And so after the service was concluded, as far as uh, the film was concerned, they had an altar call. So how many want to come down and volunteer to be a missionary? I turned to Neil and said, Neil, let's go down there. He said, I'm not going. I said, well, I'll go by myself. Went down and God never called me to the mission field. Prayed over to be a missionary, but God never said, call me to be a missionary. But I've been a friend to the missionary all these years. So the prayer that they prayed uh, was a part of that, uh, uh, that day that just has impacted my life all these years. 21 years old, was in a car accident. Uh, 
took 44 stitches in a plate up on top of my head here that just uh, almost that night wiped me out. In fact, I uh, won't take time to tell you the out-of-body experience I went through and uh, knew that uh, I, was, I, was, I was gone. But the Holy Spirit had woke my mom up in the middle of the night. She called my dad said, Dad, called my dad said, we've got to pray for him. He's in trouble. He's in big trouble. She had no idea I was been in an accident. Uh, had no idea what was going on. But the Holy Spirit woke her up and said, we've got to pray. I'm going to tell you, there's been somebody praying for you. He's one of us this morning. There's been somebody over the years that have prayed for us. Uh, the military years, I won't take time to go in. All of that, the prayers that was prayed and answered uh, during that time, I will tell you this. At the end, when I was getting ready to retire from the Air Force, I had a year left. One year left. And they uh, sent me to South Dakota <laughs> when I had put in for all the bases down on the East Coast where my home was. And uh, I was upset. Here I put all these years in. I read to retire back down at home. And, and here they sent me up where they don't even talk like I talk. I, that my wife is cold nature and it's way below <laughs> Z up most of the time. And I, it just wasn't going to work. I tried to tell God that. <laughs> I tried to explain that to the Lord. Uh, I said, Lord, you've either got to change these orders or you've got to change me. Within a week... People started bringing in pictures of the Black Hills. And man, by the time that week was over, I couldn't wait to get there. And I had an associate job in one of the large churches just waiting on me. I didn't even know it. But God had prepared all that, set all that up. It was part that it would, would put me towards full-time ministry in a place that I never thought I'd be, South Dakota. Eight and a half years there in ministry. At a place I had not wanted to go because just of a simple prayer, God, you've got to change me or change these orders. Time that you just, uh, time that I really learned how to pray. We'd only been there a few months when our anniversary was coming up in November. Been a small church of only just a handful of people. They had already voted to close the doors of the church when I told them I would take it. And that was a story in itself. That was over prayer. But it was that November, and it was our anniversary. My wife and I walked down to the Five and Dime store, Roses, and there took the cards off the rack and exchanged them, put them back on the rack, because I didn't have a dime in my pocket. We had money in the bank, but we was living on such a budget that we couldn't afford anything else. I walked out of the roses. I was, man, I was bawling. I was just, I was just broken. I was just broken. Went down to the basement of the parsonage. Said, God, I don't have to do this. I can work on any airplane in the world. I said, I don't, I don't have to put up with this. I just, I, I just. This is not what I signed up for. About two hours, God began to deal with me. Reminded me who I was working for. And that he could take care of me. I was in the right place. I was doing the right thing. And he had a plan. A little bit known to me at that moment. In those few months into this thing, how it was going to turn out. When I left there, I owned a machine shop, radiator repair shop, a apartment complex, and a three-story hotel. You say, how'd you do all that? Well, I went to work for myself. I had to because I, only $30 a week was what the church was paying me. I had a kid in college, had another one in braces like having one in college and the other one in school. But God blessed. Went through a couple of building programs, built another church for a the Indians there, debt free to them, give it to them. And God bless those eight years, went from home mission church to the sister superintendent of the state. What I'm trying to tell you this morning, when God puts you where he wants you, and you find out that he can meet your need, he can take care of you, and you put your faith and your trust in him, you will not be disappointed. 
God will bring you through it. Amen. 30 years ago here, this is a cornfield. We're in an office at the amphitheater trying to pull a church together. Many, many, many prayers over these years. Many, many prayers that have been prayed by people that I don't even know, but they was praying for me. Praying for the church, praying God would help us. It was 30 years ago. The time has gone fast, but when it's not gone fast, but I've come to understand in a greater measure that I cannot do without prayer. The question in our text this morning is why would Jesus, who the son of the living God, why, why would he need to get alone and, and pray? Why, why? He had all the ability and the senses, what we think. Uh, we think he had all power and authority is what we think. Uh, I believe what Jesus was teaching us here is, is that, and he teaches it continually through the scriptures, uh, that it was not his authority, that it was not his power that he ministered in. That he had received all of that from the Father. There is no room uh, this morning to believe that he had all the power and authority as, as the Son of Man. You know, one of the most disturbing things that people teach today is that he did it because he was all deity and had all authority. Nothing could be further from the truth. That teaching has robbed a lot of people, the scriptures, of the authority and power in the minds and the hearts of countless of people. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus himself took great pains to teach us uh, exactly where all this come from. In John, the fifth chapter, verse 19, the son can do nothing of himself. Uh, the reason Jesus stresses this is that this is a great lesson this morning. A great lesson that he wants us to learn. Uh, that we can operate at the same level. We can operate in the same way. Here's what he says in John 15, 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. Branches. He that abideth me. And I in him. The same shall bring forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. In all of our normal, ordinary activities of every day, uh, our lives, God really wants to be involved. He wants to be involved where you are uh, at work, uh, whether you're at home or uh, whatever you're doing. He wants to be involved in our lives. Uh, uh, we must uh, come to a place where we, our reliance is on Him and uh, not on ourselves. Here's the secret this morning. All power to live the Christian life comes from the Lord, not from us. Uh, what a difference it makes this morning when we begin to understand that this lesson of life is everything from Him and nothing from us. We want to be proud. We want to think I've done it. We want to think that we have made it. We have all that we have this morning uh, that comes from God has come through prayer. That Jesus could have said, look, <laughs> I love you down there. I love you down there, world. I, 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 I love you. But instead he came. He came to us. He came to this world. He laid aside all the glory of heaven. Here's what Philippians, the second chapter, verse 7 says. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man. Verse 8 says, and being found in, for, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In that obedience, Jesus poured. All that made him God into man so that man could have all of God. So when we look this morning at the grace, the love, the mercy, and the blessing and kindness of God in our lives, we need to remember who made it possible, where it come from. Life's greatest lesson this morning is learning how to get along with God, uh, giving him praise Worship, adoration, releasing all your doubts, your fears, uh, your life issues and struggles and all of those things to the one who loves you the most. Expecting him in his presence, his peace, his provision and protection to take you where you could never go yourself. I want to tell you this morning what I've tried to say in all of this. 
is these times of prayer. When you get alone with God and you give him time, he works things in your life that there's no other way to work it. It can't be taught. It cannot be, uh, you cannot learn it any other way. It's got to be in his presence to where you realize who he is. And when his touch is on your life, when he, when he is there and in those moments that you sense his presence, I'm going to tell you it makes all the difference in the world how you look at life, how you look at the situations, how you perceive what's taking place. You understand that a lot of things that are, are taking place. It's not that person that's acting ugly. <laughs> They're just being used. And you begin to see things in a different perspective. You begin to love people that you couldn't love any other way. You begin to, to want to help people in ways that you would never want to do it any other way. It's in his presence alone. Those moments that your will, your character, your attitude, all that is aligned with him and it makes all the difference in the world. I'm talking about that prayer time this morning. Thank you the Lord for what he has done. One of the ways this morning we're going to thank him is we're going to come to the communion table and we're going to receive this morning the image for which he gave us to acknowledge his death on the cross, the blood that he shed for the remission of our sin. He said, as often as you do this, you just show it to the, show it to the Lord's death. It's the most sacred thing that you can do. One of the most sacred acts of worship this morning is these moments of receiving communion. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning as we come to this table, simply ask this morning uh, would you search our hearts? Uh, Father, if there's, we've said anything, done anything, thought anything, acted in a way that was inappropriate, uh, would you forgive us? Cleanse us afresh and anew this morning. Let us come to this table this morning acknowledging uh, that our life is in you, that, Lord, uh, everything we have comes from you this morning. Uh, the blessings this morning uh, of every day, every day that we have a, uh, we get up of a morning, uh, we're able to go and do. It's a blessing that comes uh, from the throne of heaven. Uh, ask you right now, Lord, in these moments, uh, take us back to the foot of the cross uh, when we've committed our lives to you uh, and ask you to be our Lord and our Savior. Help us this morning to look back over these last days and ask the question, have I been with the one who loves me the most, as I should? Have I given him the time to acknowledge his greatness, his goodness, his love, and his mercy? Have I given him those moments that I should give him an acknowledgement of what he's done for me? Father, sometimes we've got to say we've failed. Forgive us. I'm asking this morning as we come to this table, let it be a moment where we not only search our heart, but are thankful for what you have done. And commit ourselves to a stronger walk and a stronger prayer life than ever before. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand with me and those that's going to help me this morning? Would you come?
We're always humbled this morning, at this moment. I want you to bow your hearts with me this morning. I'm going to ask Jamie this morning if she will give thanks for the bread and for the juice this morning. Thank you. Everyone drink. Father, we thank you this morning just for the privilege of being in your house, privilege of being in your presence, the privilege this morning of coming to this table. Thank you so much for our time together in the house of the Lord. I ask that you go with each precious person this morning. Give them rest into their bodies. Yes. Bring them back tonight for a special time in your house. Uh, for those that gather around the altar this morning, uh, would you just be with them? Grant unto them uh, moments of refreshing uh, around this altar with you. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, God. But we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Lord bless you. These altars are open this morning.